interactive. So feel free as we go along, if you have a question, uh, just to interject. So I've started recording the meeting and we're going to start um, our demo with the PA share home screen. There's a lot of useful information here on the screen. And um, I think probably what if you're using PA share, what you might find to be the most helpful are these help materials. So if you click on this link, it will take you to our help materials screen. There are some tutorials that um, I sent via email, one for signing in and subscribing to PA Share. Has everyone or most everyone had a chance to set up uh, their Keystone login? Maybe. I believe so. Is there anyone on, our, on the FEMA team that hasn't been able to set that up? I think we should be good. I, I, I did okay. uh, send out the instructions to everyone, so I didn't okay. hear of anybody having any issues. OK, great. So that that seems to be the biggest hurdle for external users, so setting up their Keystone login account. So that's good to, to know. Um, and then the one that you're probably going to be most interested in, and we're going to kind of walk through that in the demo, is submitting a new environmental review product PA share. So there are tutorials that literally go step by step. There's also a frequently asked questions page. So if you click on this, there are questions that are very specific to environmental review projects. So you might want to take a look at those and scroll through them. Um, these do get updated from time to time. Uh, so you know it's a good idea to check back. We are making updates to the system um, as we go along. If there's anything major that changes, um, We'll let you know, but there's some useful things in here like my project involves multiple locations. How do I map it when I send in an initial submission of a project? So I would encourage you to visit these questions and then also back on the home screen. <clears throat> and the help is the um, email for our help desk, which is PA share at PA.gov. So if you have any questions about um, the system, if you have glitches in using it, it's best to reach out to the help desk first. And then if you have specific questions on your projects, you can reach out to your reviewers. Um, so that's kind of really useful tools that we wanted to make you aware of. And I th we'll just go ahead here with our demo. I'm going to be using our test site so that I'm not actually submitting a project and um, it's easy to happen, but if you've created a Keystone login account, you may have already done this, but using this as an external user without um, a Commonwealth of Pennsylvania account, you're going to use the citizen login. So we go through the disclaimer. When you get to the screen, you're going to click on citizen login, and this is where you're going to enter your external user information or your Keystone login account and password. Okay, and then um, that's going to take you here to the home screen. So it looks like it turned something at the top of my screen. I didn't want to, sorry. One tip, um, you can't run really run PA share with all the functionality in um, Internet Explorer. You need to use Chrome or uh, Edge or some other um, Internet browser because it's not functional um, in Explorer. So that's something to keep in mind. So here we are at the home screen. This is the external user home screen. And there's new information if we post new information or make it will be here on this bulletin board in the upper part of the screen. There's a lot of different information in here. Um, you can search and submit using um, these um, components of the screen. There's information on subscriptions. There's a lot of information um, if you want to look through it. I tend to use these buttons up here at the top for submit and search and to go home because they're quick and easy and accessible. 
The first thing you're going to want to do, though, when you come into the system is you're going to want to go up here to the upper right hand corner with the head and shoulders and look at your profile. You're going to want to edit it and then update um, your address. I, I can't do that the way I'm logged in, but if once you save your address and update it, then it will always show that way when you add, add yourself as a contact on a project. So that's a good tip too, to make sure you update your profile before you really start using it. So this is the home page. What you're probably going to use the most is this dashboard over here on the left. And we're going to come back and visit this in a moment. But first, um, we're going to talk about how you submit a project. So up here at the top, second button is submit. We'll click on that. And here from the submit homepage, you can see that we're not only using PA Share to submit environmental review projects, but for a lot of other things in our office like markers, national register nominations, um, someone wants a DOE to see if their property is eligible and could be listed. So this program serves a lot of different functions within our office, but what you're going to be specifically concerned about here on the submit page is this environmental review wizard for new projects, new initial submissions. And then if you're sending in additional information that we haven't asked for, um, it, the project supplement wizard down here. So we're gonna start with the environmental review wizard. Click on visit. So this will take you to the environmental review um, initial submission screen. So this is for a new project um, that you haven't added information or sent in information previously. Um, so if you have an existing project, we'll talk about what to do, but this is for a new project. Um, and this, you know, we are trying to collect the most basic information here uh, for us to carry out a review. So the fields that have a red asterisk are those that are required. And you can see um, if you look at this that the screen looks a good bit or has collects a lot of the same information as the project review form did. Okay, so you've got overall project overview agencies, project location. <clears throat> One of the main differences, <clears throat> excuse me, is you'll be mapping your project now, your location. And then um, if you have resources that are going to be affected, you'll be adding those. Uh, and that's for above ground only. And then project documents like photos or attachments are here at the bottom. And you'll notice as I scroll down over here on the right side of the screen, there's some help text uh, that you can reference and um, that can be useful. So again, red asterisks are required. And I think at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Casey and he's gonna um, demonstrate how to, to data enter a project. Are there any questions at this point while we kind of switch sharing up to sharing screens? Um, I guess the only question I have right now is, um, are folks submitting um, Word document consultation letters in addition to everything that's being entered in the system? Is that still yes. the... Yep. Oh, okay, just making sure. They can, I mean, that, that's absolutely fine. They can add that as an attachment. Um, because as Casey will go through, he'll show you that um, some of these fields like project description are limited in the number of characters you can include. So we encourage you to, to supplement. Exactly. Um, can you. everybody see my screen? Yes, we can see yeah. it. All right. So contact information, like Barbara said, um, we're going to add primary contact information. I've already entered my data. Uh, I've updated my my profile so everything here is already entered so i'm just going to click save um i'm listed as the primary contact um this is the person who will be responsible for responding to shipper requ requests um secondary contacts are others who should receive notifications of submissions and shipper responses um it's important to remember that all staff can change so we encourage you to include more than one person as a project contact so if somebody leaves the agency it's good to have somebody else on there um anyone listed as a contact can see information on the project anyone who's not listed on the on as a contact on the project cannot see information 
Um, if you're submitting on behalf of an agency, this is where you may want to include the agency contact if known. So that's for contractors. So if you have a contractor submitting a project for you, make sure that they add the, you as the agency contact in addition to themselves. All right, project, and I'm using um, the, uh, the lease construction project example that we sent around to uh, enter data. Um, you can follow along if you like. Um, project overview. This includes the general project information that should be supported by the project documents. Um, so this is, you know, the basic information about the project. So in this case, uh, the the GSA is um, going to build a facility for FEMA. Um, so it's an option. And then, you know, so sorry, going back to projects. Oh, sorry. Project name is the official name of the project. Barbara, did you want to say something here? Yeah, I would say one thing that's a little different that um, particularly for FEMA and maybe HUD who send in a lot of demolitions, the way the system works is we would like to track um, projects that have the potential for an adverse effect um, individually. So right now I know that you send in maybe multiple demolitions in one community or location or vicinity. Um, we're asking now that you submit those individually. Um, so in the project name, you would put in the address. And if it was one of four, you would let us know that. Um, so let's say you had four demos in a community. You put in the address of the one you're data entering. Note it was one of four. And then we, then we would ask that you save that and not submit it. Go ahead and data enter the other three. You can attach the same letter, like if you're doing those all as one review, that's fine. We just want to track them individually because demolition sometimes has the potential for an adverse effect. Um, so you would data enter each building individually. You could add the same letter for all four of those. You would note how many there are in the project name and also um, when we get down to the project, um, location information and I'll show you that in a minute when I do the demo of the um, I think I have elevations but it's the same concept um, but for demos again we're really specifically asking you to enter each of those separately not change your documentation and having it all in one letter it's just that we'd like to track them separately as separate projects NPA share right yeah this is a uh... The project example we're using isn't exactly a typical FEMA project. Uh, it's actually a GSA project, but um, it's more of a straightforward project for a demo. So uh, going back, lease name, I mean, project name is the name of the project. Um, project description is a brief narrative description of your project, uh, in, often included on your letter. Uh, it's, it's basically just your general description of the project. Um, you can grab the lower box of most of these and expand. I think you have uh, a thousand characters for the project description, so it's quite a bit of use. Um, if you need more space, you can always add attachments at the end, like we said. Um, present land use includes descriptions of the current conditions. Um, in this case, the parcel is undeveloped and a combination of agricultural filled and wooded area. Previous land use um, includes a description of past land use or modifications to the property. We're interested in understanding if there's a previous ground disturbance or changes that have been made to a building or property use over time. Uh, historical aerial mapping or site histories can be uploaded as project documents to support the information here. So even if there's like a, um, a known uh, pipeline going through the, the project area, we want to know that information. So even if it is undeveloped generally, um, any type of disturbance we're interested in. So now the involves ground disturbance is just a checkbox. Um, more information on the horizontal extent and na nature of the ground disturbing activities 
um, including plans, drawings, maps, et cetera, are all included as attachments in the project documents. Um, you need to enter if there are any buildings more than 45 years of age um, that are proposed for demolition or has substantial changes to the exterior that would affect the affect the building's integrity. In this case, we have no existing above ground resources within the property. Um, this property project includes both construction and that's it. Sorry. Um, agencies. Uh, agencies. You can you can enter as many agencies as you like. In this case, we have two. We have the, the GSA. Sorry, I'm running a little slowly there. The GSA is the um, primary. You can enter um, program and permit name if that uh, if they have those. In this case, we do not. And then we'll add FEMA as the secondary agency. My drop down is not working. Sorry about this. Needs to wake up. So may I ask if we are consulting with another agency, so for example, US Fish and Wildlife Service, is, would you want that indicated in this section here or is it only agencies that may have um, some sort of ownership or funding um, as part of this project? No, it would work just as Section 106 works. So if you if there's a lead federal agency, you identify them as the primary agency and then all other agencies that are consulting, you can select as additional agencies. Um, if you add them, if you add uh, representatives from those agencies as contacts, they'll receive notifications for the projects too. So it's a it's a it's a handy way to do consultation. Gotcha, thank you. I'm going to move on because the select a additional agencies does not seem to be working right now. Um, the test environment, which we're in right now, is um, in constant updates, and so sometimes things may not work. Uh, the actual production site that you'd be using as a public site should be just fine. All right. So project location. Um, in this case, uh, it, I assume it'll. It'll be a lease property, so it's still going to be private property. Um, you just enter address. Um, you can also enter latitude, longitude. You can enter um, intersections, that type of thing. It's pretty. It's it's pretty intuitive in terms of um, searching because you'll you'll use this address to search your uh, your project area below, and I'll show you that. And if you have a project that has multiple locations that aren't necessarily going to have an adverse effect, like an elevation maybe, then you could just put in the first location. A note in the project description that the project covers multiple locations and then upload a map as an attachment to the on the project documents for, so we can see all the other locations. The other option is you can map discontiguous project areas when we get down to the mapping. Right. AP description, um, the, as you know, the AP is the geographic area or areas which a project may directly or indirectly cause changes in the character of above ground historic properties. Uh, remember, the project determines the project APE. Uh, the AP includes the Project's physical boundaries, as well as potential visual, vibrational, and audible effects to above ground resources. Uh, the written description must match the mapping of the APE further down the screen. Uh, for new construction or rehabs that are sizable and would introduce new features, then you'd want to include the surrounding area with surrounding properties within view. The APE will be calculated, the APE area will be calculated. By the system when you map it. So see where it has zero right now. Um, once we map it, those those will populate. I'm 
going down to the APE now. Can everybody see the map, like those things on, my screen's frozen. Can everybody else see what Casey's talking about on your screen? No, I think we're still seeing the project location. Yeah, yeah. Okay, it's, it's moving now. Sorry, I'm, 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 I was, uh, I'm on the other document. Okay. Sorry. All right, so in this case, it's a 38.8 acre area. Um, the LOD is the same. LOD being limits of disturbance. The limits of disturbance is a required field for those projects that involve ground disturbance, as this one does. Uh, this is the focus here is on archaeological resources. Um, if you completed the involves ground disturbance checks box above, the LOD will be required. Um, you described the limit of disturbance. The limit of the disturbance is defined by the area of total earth disturbance for the project. Uh, this includes new construction, utilities, access roads, etc. So since I entered a project address up here, I can click on this zoom to map project area, uh, project address. And that takes us to our project area. Um, this is where we'll map our APE. First, I'm going to show you a few functions on the, the map itself. Um, there are four buttons up here in the right corner. Uh, the top one will change your base map. So Im imagery hybrid is your aerials. You have numerous choices. The bottom one is the uh, historic topos that we used to ask for in um, our paper reviews. The second button down are your uh, visible layer so we have basically the same things that we used to have on crgis um, if you go down to the pa share map you expand this this is where you can see all of our our data or hide our data in this case if you did not want to see archaeological resources i could turn those off and they disappear um, typically district resources kind of get in your way so that if you're if you're looking for archaeological <laughs> resources you may want to turn that off um, otherwise we have um, you know other things that can be defined like soils physiographic zones and if you click on them then it defines what they are um, going back down to archaeological or any type of resource here's a above ground resource you can click on that um it got real glitchy sorry so here's a resource uh the jacob shank farm if you scroll down you can go to the click view details and it'll take you and give you the details of that resource it opens up a separate window. It was an eligible property. And you can tell that um, easier by going to here, the third button down. This is uh, the legend. So I'll tell you that that green circle is an eligible site. Currently, all archaeological sites are just black polygons. That may change sooner or later, but as of right now, that's what it is. Yeah, and one difference between PA share and CRJS that I know a lot of people have noted to me is that in CRJS you could turn the layers on and off based on eligibility. Um, it's based on the resource type in PA share, so it's a little different in that respect. And then down here at this corner, uh, the bottom left corner, you can expand it to do a full full view. Um, it, sometimes it makes it a little bit easier to draw your APE in this field. All right, and then at the bottom right corner, you have two tools to draw your APE. 
um, the cloud with an arrow is the upload. So if you have a shape file, um, shape files have to be drawn in ArcMap. We do not accept KMZs. Um, so if you've had something that's been drawn in Mar ArcMap, you can easily upload that and it, and it'll populate uh, the shape file. Um, it'll it'll generate on the screen. The other one is the uh, sketch wizard. You just click on this to hand draw your APE um, and LOD. So in this case, we're going to do that. You have your APE here. You're going to draw a polygon. You have a choice to draw a polygon or a square. The polygon is much more useful. I would avoid using the square. Down to our here. So to draw a APE polygon, you just it's like drawing a KMZ in Google Earth. You click at your beginning corner, you move over to your next uh, point. You click there again, down to your next point. Until you've drawn generally your APE and all the way back up to the first point to close it. Um, to draw your LOD, you click on the LOD tab here. You have the option to copy your APE as your LOD, which we would do for this project because the APE and the LOD are the same thing. So you could you could click on that and it will turn a different color. Um, you can also uh, draw your LOD. So say this is this is the project APE for visual effect, um, but you really are only developing a small portion of the parcel right here. And then if you then you have a, an access drive that you want to add, you can draw another discontiguous APE or LOD, sorry. Um, so you have one more um, wetland that you're going to create. You can put that over here. It is important to note that you cannot draw any of your L LOD outside the APE. It won't allow you to do that. See a validation error the the LOD polygon must lie within the APE, so you can you can select that and throw it all away. In our case, we're going to copy the LOD the APE as the LOD. We've done that. Um, to upload one, I'm gonna, and we're going to go to a different place in this world when I upload one because I don't have a shape file for this location. You just click on the um, icon with the cloud. You're going to choose a file from your desktop. It'll process. While we're waiting, you can see that the APE and the LOD were uh, areas were auto populated up here. Oh, didn't take us there. We had success. It should have zoomed us to this area. I don't know why it did not. Um, this is Point State Park. Uh, this is their management area. It's just a shape file I had on hand. Um, it's important to note that if you do upload your APE as a shape file, you cannot draw, hand sketch your LOD. So you also have to upload a shape file to populate your LOD. So we'll just do the same thing here. And it's processing. And it's success. Um, so if you go down to, you'll see that once we've done that, um, the municipality and county have auto populated, so it knows where your project is. But when you drew the APE or and LOD, in this case, we uploaded shape files and took you there. Um, that is all I have. I'm going to switch this back over to Barbara. Okay. Do we have any questions at this point while we switch?
Nothing from me. I don't, anyone else have any questions? No. Okay. So, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We can and, see environmental review. Okay, good. And can you see 811 River Road here in the project name? Yes, we see that. Okay. All right, good deal. So I'm going to pick up, um, we're going to show you all the responses on the back end in a minute, but I just wanted to go in and show you a couple things um, specific to above ground resources. So I went ahead and data entered some information on one of the elevations that we sent you yesterday, uh, specifically 811 River Road. And we had said, um, if it's a demo, you're going to want to send those in individually. And I think this will help you explain, understand why in a moment. Um, so if it is a demo, this is an elevation, but let's pretend it's a demo. You're gonna wanna put one of four, like if you have them all in one letter, um, there were four, I think, in this submission, you would wanna note that in the project name. And it, again, down here at the bottom, there are three buttons that are gonna follow you the whole time that you're using the screen. The first one is save and continue. That enables you to save your work as you go along. Uh, PA share times out. Um, it's at least 30 minutes. I think they've actually increased the time. But if you're not active in it, the system can time out. There'll certainly be warnings before that, but it's a good idea to hit save and continue. But let's say you have multiple submissions that you want to send success se sequentially because they, um, you know, are all related, you could hit finish later and, you know, data enter each one, hit finish later. And then when you finish the last one, submit to SHPO and then go back into your my submissions queue and, and submit them around the same time. That way we get similar numbers, but I'll show you the my submissions queue in a minute. So here's about how you want to um, data enter that multiple demo. You want to add the numbers in the project name. I've already completed a lot of this information. This is for an elevation, so I just noted the building's going to be raised 11.95 feet. Um, again, a lot of this information will be in your supplemental information, so you can keep it brief. I noted that there is the potential for ground disturbance. There's one or more resources, their age, and then um, added FEMA as the agency, and I've mapped or I've added a project address. So I'm going to zoom the map to the project address at this point. And you're gonna see um, here on the map that this, here's the project location and this is a, a previous uh, project in our system, um, which is why there's an orange dot there for an unevaluated resource. Um, but if I, you look at this, this green layer that's showing up um, is an eligible resource. I click on it and I can see that it's the Irwinna Historic District. It's eligible. I click on you, it will give me some basic information on that resource. Um, and like Casey showed you, if you have multiple resources in one location, you click on a point, you could get many, many layers. So I am in the Irwinna Historic District. I'm also um, within a boundary for River Road. Uh, looks like it was a bridge that was previously evaluated as not eligible. And then 811 River Road um, was previously documented. But if I was delineating this APE, I would just zoom in on the project area. And as Casey showed you, use the polygon feature. Um, with the mapping tool here. I, let's see, I held down my mouse and so it's gonna click on every point. If I don't, um, if I'm not happy with that, I can go ahead and, you know, you can go ahead and close the polygon if you click on that original point. And then down here, um, you can highlight that shape and hit the trash can and it'll scrap it. 
uh, I see my districts are show, showing up and that's kind of distracting me. So I could go in here and um, turn off the districts. I can turn off the whole map if I click on this PHR map. So the mapping is probably one of the harder things to negotiate, but once you figure out some of these tricks, it's not that bad. So here's the property. I'm gonna map it again. Click, 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 click. And um, my LO, you, know, you really have to click on that last point and it should then infill the polygon so you have your APE. My LOD is gonna be something smaller, like around the footprint of the house. So I'm just gonna map that quickly. All right, so I'm gonna get out of this. So what you're gonna see down here though, is it's completed the municipalities based on your mapping. And then the resources within the project area have been updated. So this is a list of previously identified resources in the APE. And let's say, um, you know, this is a new project for the Patricia Cook property to 811 River Road. And I know that, say it's a demo, going, going off the grid here with our project, but say I know I'm gonna demolish it. Then I need to go in and update that resource information. And this here are the, is the building resource details screen. This is specifically the screen if you're updating an existing resource, something that's already in our system, it's been previously identified, you would go in here and you're kind of reconciling that data. So what we know about it from the past documentation is over here on the right side, okay? And then the information you're gonna add is over here on the left. So you're gonna see that there's red asterisks here on address the boundary, photographs, and I think that's, and okay, it's asking you for the resource name. So it, it will require you to update those fields. Um, if I wanted to, um, show, I'm gonna show you, if I hit save and continue, it's gonna show you exactly which fields need to be added before you can save the record. So it says errors exist, the resource cannot be saved, then it should highlight in red specifically which fields are required. So I just want you to see that while it says I need to add an asterisk because it has, or an address because it has the red asterisk, the only field that's actually required here is photograph and I thought maybe the surveyor. Yeah, the recorder. So at a minimum, if you are going to affect a building, and it comes up in that previously identified resources list, you need to click on it and update, uh, add a photograph. Um, when you go to add attachments or photographs to the system, we're asking that you use file from local disk and not add a URL. Um, and I think eventually the URL option will probably go away. And then you can add, I encourage you to just put the description in the name of the photo. The description field is required as well, but that may be going away. Um, so I would encourage you to put your description in the name and you can upload your files. And you see we can accept a lot of different kinds of photos. The maximum file size for uploading in PHR is 70 megabytes, so it can take pretty big attachments, but they do take, if it's a big attachment, it's gonna take a while to upload. So <clears throat> I've added a photo and now it shows up as a thumbnail here. It'll also show up as a thumbnail on the resource page. So whenever you add a resource, at a minimum, we ask that you add one photo here. Because the photos take a long time to upload, we're okay with you adding the rest of the photos um, as attachments, as photo pages, you know, like a PDF of photo pages, that's fine. So I had to add the photograph. There's a lot of different fields here and I'm gonna show you those in a minute. <clears throat> and you also have to add the recorder name. So re the recorder should be whoever was in the field doing the documentation. Um, it shouldn't be the person 
doing the data entry. It should be whoever actually went out and took the photograph. Um, and then I'm gonna hit save and continue. Oh, forgot to put my reason. So anytime, you know, if that red box comes up, just go back up and look through your project to see what you missed. <clears throat> it still won't let me save. Oh, I forgot to hit save here. Still getting used to it myself. All right, so it says the resource has been saved. I'm gonna close. So it will take me back out here and that um, update info button is now grayed out. So that indicates that I have updated the information. Here I can see the resource number. And um, if you, I'll, I'll explain the number system when we get over to search in a minute, but if you have to add a new resource, let's say that this was never previously identified, you're gonna click on add a building resource and you're using the building function um, for individual buildings as well as farms. Um, there's also districts, bridges, cemeteries and um, non-buildings, which are sites. Um, so you have to add the address. And on this screen, the fields that have the red asterisks are truly required. It's going to require you to map the resource boundary. Generally, it's going to be the same thing um, as the tax parcel. If you map that as your APE, you can just go right over that and map it. I'm not being super precise here uh, in the interest of time. OK, so there's my resource mapped. It's going to require me to add a photo. I'm not going to do that because I showed you how to do it. It's also going to um, require some basic summary information, okay? So if you remember our abbreviated Historic Resource Survey form, this identification section of the Building Resource Details screen is the old abbreviate, abbreviated HRSF. So essentially, the required fields here at the top of this screen, that's what you're, you're completing is the abbreviated HRSF. So we have resource name, um, if it's a building or a structure, function, historic and current, foundation, wall material, roof material, uh, style, year built. And there's a lot of other fields um, that we're not acquiring. If you actually had a farm um, or a complex, you definitely want to use this add outbuilding um, field because it will let you add multiple buildings with some basic information um, like, you know, what it is, when it was built, um, and what it, the predominant material is and the date. So that's, that's useful to know about. But the last thing that's required here is recorder. And again, if you have a building um, that you have multiple photographs for, um, we're at, we've asked them to move the attachments up, but it's just the attachments are still down here below the evaluation section. So you've filled in the identification level information. Then you would add your photo pages. You may have, you added one JPEG, let's say, to the resource. Then you'd add your photo pages PDF here as an attachment. Okay, we're not expecting you to upload each picture. Um, I will note that if you're doing a full DOE on the property then this is the part of the screen that you would use. You would complete um, a brief summary of, of if why you think it is uh, significant, if you're saying it's significant, criteria, the area of significance, and the period of significance. You would still also add your historical narrative pages um, and your evaluation pages, similar to what you, we had in the HRSF. They would just be added as an attachment here at the bottom of the screen. So. That kind of gives you an introduction to um, the building resource data entry. Again, the only we're requiring you to complete this if you're going to physically affect a building. Um, particularly for demos, you're going to have to send them individually if you know there's potential for an adverse effect. Um, but if this was, you know, I I would data enter all of those. Use finish later, finish later, finish later, and then when um, you're ready to submit them, you should submit to the SHPO. So 
project documents, you're, you've been sending in the project review form with an attachment that has your, maybe your letter and then um, your photo pages and your site plans and your description. I think for you guys, the description is usually in the letter um, and any plans, you can add that as one large attachment. That's our preference that you actually go in here again and just write, this is the project description, plans, photos. Um, if you made abbreviated HRSFs before, you can go ahead and attach them. You know, those forms have gone away. The fields here in PA Share replace those forms. But if you've already created them, we'd be happy for you to attach them. But again, our preference is you attach that as one big PDF so we can quickly look at it rather than opening up multiple documents. I choose attachment type document and then the description isn't required here. I, I prefer you just put the description in the name of the document. This one is going to be a little longer, take a little longer to upload because it was a little bit bigger. But then um, I think ultimately it saves you time because if you uploaded the description, the plans, the photos, and say you had abbreviated HRSF separately, that would take even longer. So we're trying to um, use the system to be efficient. We think it, it does work better for reviews because it collects all the information in one place and you can see that, we can see that, uh, what was submitted, how we've responded. Um, it's all attached to the project. You can also go in here and access our response. Um, and we think that we're going to be able to improve our response times um, as we get used to using the system. Um, the way things work now is we have a group of people that triage the projects as they come in. And if they don't see concerns, then they are responding um, in PA share. If they see potential concerns, then they're going on to the environmental reviewers, the above ground and the archaeology reviewers if there are archaeology concerns, um, and they they will look at them more carefully. So now you can see that there's my attachment. It's been uploaded. Um, if you upload the wrong thing, you can always edit it or delete it. But I've, I've finished adding my project information. I'm in test, so I'm going to hit submit to SHPO. It's probably going to be missing a field because I didn't I think there's something at the top of it complete. Partial resources exist. Okay, what that's telling me is that resource on 811 River Road that I began to enter, I did not finish, and that's true. I didn't finish all of it. I'm just going to delete that so I can show you what the screen looks like. Okay, so when you finish um, data entering, uh, project at initial submission, you're going to get the screen that shows you a token number. So I'm going to switch over to a different PowerPoint or um, to a PowerPoint right now. If you bear with me, do you guys have questions at this point? Um, I do. I have one question and then I do believe that some of our team has additional questions as well. So I'm not sure if it would be best to save them to the end or did you want to try to address some things now? You go right ahead because I'm having issues seeing my PowerPoint. Okay. <laughs> so my question is, um, if a property is eligible and it would require a long form, we're still attaching that as a separate thing. There's nothing within the system that's replacing the long form cur currently, there, correct? The system does replace the long form. That's a good question. Oh, OK. Um, and what what isn't there yet? is the ability to take that information you've data entered and turn it into a PDF, like a form, okay? But you can go in and data enter all that resource information and send it to us, and we will be able to see everything you data entered on the resource. So it does replace the long form. What we're saying is if you already have forms that you've prepared, feel free to attach them and fill in the basic information. In PA share, be it a long form or an abbreviated form. But in the future, when you, you know, you're not preparing those anymore because you know you're going to go in and data enter it into PA share, that's fine. That's all you have to do. You don't have to fill out the Word documents and create PDFs and attach them. So, gotcha. 
Okay, yeah. great. And then yep. I don't know if um, if you're ready to move on. I know Kelly does have a few questions as well. So if, if you know, it's up to you if you'd like to address them now or, or if, come back if, to that. If they're on data entry, I think that's fine. If it's on responses or the um, external dashboard, we'll wait for those. Yeah, they're all um, related to um, data entry. So I recently submitted my first project um, that was for, I think it was like a perfect storm of everything that you could have, but it was for previously unevaluated property um, that had been identified. So the SHPO back in 2015 didn't make a determination, but it was, you know, an orange dot. Um, we found the property to still be eligible. So I basically did the, um, you know, equivalent to a long form, had a lot of information, a lot of graphics, a lot of historic context, um, like 65 bibliographical entries and things like that. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of my questions came from um, uploading that. My first couple were about the bibliography. Um, do you have to submit, because I put all of them one by one, like at each one was like a, in its own like data entry um, and I also basically put them in um, a PDF Word document um, but do you have to submit bibliographical entries one by one and if so um, I uh, just found it kind of um, there weren't many options to choose from so like there were you know books websites journal articles but I had other like newspaper clippings and things like that that really didn't have um, a source type to identify with so I just kind of pick the best one. Okay. Yeah, I I think that's an excellent question. I don't want to answer it uh, for our survey staff. My inclination as an ER person, as a former consultant, is enter the main ones and attach the rest um, because I'm always about efficiency. Uh, mm -hmm. But I will, I will follow up and I will ask our survey staff that question and, and get back to you. Okay, yeah, because it, it took a good amount of time for me to do yeah. that. And I did have like a larger resource, but um, yeah, a lot of just a lot of the things didn't really, the fields that you enter just didn't fit the, the types of resources. Right. Um, so my next one is, I think you kind of answered it, but I did find that you weren't really able, I, again, I was tr playing around with this system as um, for a first time user and I, you know, kept going in and out of the resource because I wasn't completely done with it and I just kind of wanted to see how I had to present the information. Mm -hmm. um, and I did get stalled saying that like it was incomplete, but I basically just have to put like a filler photo in just to essentially shut the system up. Correct. Mm -hmm. Like I just can't like just um, you right. just basically have to put the filler information until you're ready to to move on and submit the full formal information should let you save and continue and then go back in and finish the data entry it didn't uh -huh. let you do that no i just always had to because i hadn't like labeled the photos or like you know put them on a map yet and i didn't really mm -hmm. know which ones i was going to use so i just put a that was my biggest one i just had a photo that like would never um that I just kind of like put in so i could close out of it and like figure out what i needed to do next yeah i mean i the way I understand it works and the way it showed up as a partial resource when I did that demo is if you hit save and continue, it may complain at you like you're missing fields, but it's going to save what you have in there. Um, so I guess I just couldn't close out of the window. Yeah, it wouldn't let you go out of it. I think, yeah. you, I mean, you could just, you may just have to manually close it. Okay. Um, that, that's a good question and I, I'll follow up with that. And then my last one is, I apologize because I didn't really note the error that I received and I should have, but I updated this um, this existing resource and I found that um, basically, again, I was going in and out of this resource, updating it as I went, but I found that I would, um, I created, you know, basically it gave me like a new resource once I updated the original one and I'd go back in the next day and continue working on it and I would click on the previously identified resource and it would be completely blank because I guess it was still that previously identified resource is like the unedited version. So you have to, if you go back in, you have to basically update the quote unquote new resource Okay. that was generated when you when you updated with your new information and that is a question for um our data people 
Okay, because I like, thought that I lost the information because I went in. I was like, I put this all in already. Right. And then I had, I scrolled down and I had like four or five different entries for the same property. Right. I think it, there's some functionality there and you're not the first person to have that question. So um, I think if you can send me an email with that very specific, like that's a specific scenario, or if you encounter it again and you, you're you having, you know, issues like that, feel free to like, use your snipping tool, take a screenshot and send it to us, um, send it to me and I will send it over because there are some glitches with updating the resources. Um, we just went live on February 22nd and the system is not flawless. Um, so I, I know that PennDOT specifically has had some of those similar issues. Um, so yeah, please send it in an email and, you know, especially if you, if you're in the middle of using it and you see it happening and you can take a screenshot that helps the developers understand the issues and we can yeah i can do it because i got the error when i clicked like the plus mark okay. or whatever and they okay. and they previously identified and it wouldn't let me do it so okay, um, okay i will do that next time or, or try to figure it out thank you i think that's all that i had okay anybody else i i just want to add that at the initial submission that we're doing here these are initial submissions do not add any archaeological resources. I can show you when uh, Barbara's finished um, how we add archaeological resources. I don't think you, as FEMA, uh, enters too many of them, and you, you probably have consultants do it, but um, just a heads up, please do not enter yeah. archaeological resources at the initial review. Yep. Okay, so um, we have about two minutes left, but I think we're going to go about 15 minutes long, so I hope everybody's okay with that not we're recording and you can grab um, this later on so this is uh, everybody see the thank you for your submission screen with the token number yes okay so this is great this is the screen that you see um, once you've submitted your project you hit submit to shippo and it's complete this is what shows up but there are a number of system generated email messages that are sent from PA share every time you submit information or we respond. Some of these are actually going to be eliminated um, because we're finding we don't need them. Um, so, like I said, we're the systems are work in progress and we're updating it. Every Thursday we go to test with new changes. So um, if they're major changes, we'll let you know. But a lot of these are tweaks to make it better. And reporting back information like Kelly just did is what is making it better. So we encourage you to do that. So there's Thank you for your submission. Um, at, after you, um, sub, actually at the time you add yourself as a contact and you go to create an initial environmental review submission, you're gonna get this email that says a token has been assigned. This email will actually be going away soon at some point. Um, it essentially just says you've put something into the system. This is an email response that says, your submission has been received. So you submit to SHPO. Um, this is just telling you it's been received. And if you want, you can click on that link where it says you can access the initial submission. That would take you into PA Share. You'd have to log in, but then it would take you directly to the submission. Um, this one too will be going away because it really doesn't serve a purpose. And you'll understand why when I show you the external um, user dashboard. Another common um, response, this one is critical. This is if you send in a submission, an initial submission, and it requires additional information, we aren't going to turn that into a project until you send us the additional information. So the comments by PA Shippo that you see on this email where it says, please provide additional project documents or information to make this a complete record, okay? And there's a link. That is the only place this comment exists, is in this email. It doesn't exist in our system because we haven't accepted this as a project yet. So it's important to save these emails if you get a notification that we require additional information on an initial submission. This one will not be going away. Also, um, when your submission is accepted, so that group of people that screen the projects and generally clear those that are obviously no effect. Um, those are the people that take your submission, accept it, and turn it into a project. So when they do that, then you're going to get a project number assigned. 
So if you see here, um, the project number that was assigned is 2021. So that's the year, PR for project, and then a sequential number. PA share um, assigns project numbers to all of our program areas. Um, so there, there's no longer an ER number with a year hyphen, um, county code hyphen, and then the sequential number. It, all the numbers are now year PR for project and then a sequential number. Same thing for resources. If it, it was the year it was first recorded, RE for resource and then a sequential number. Surveys, you'll see a similar format. Reports, there's a sim similar format. So just suffice it to say that's our new format and that this is the email that lets you know you have been assigned a project number. And then finally, this is probably the most important one. Um, it tells you that there's a response um, on your project that's waiting. So that's the one that you know people are waiting for um, to receive so that they can uh, go in and check the response. So I'm going to pull up one here. I'm going to click on um, that link in that email. And pretty quick, soon I'm going to share a different screen with you. This, when you click on that link, it's going to take you to um, the PA share login screens, which is what I'm doing right now. And then that's going to take you to the response screen. And I want to just go over that and explain it to you. So let me stop sharing that. It's taking a while. But the response screen um, contains our actual response. And if there's a letter, it will be found on the response screen. So that's probably one of the more important components of PA Share to understand. Okay, it's taking forever to load. Um, let me just do something different. Let me share. I have a response screen. Do you want me to share my response screen? Well, I just, here, I got it. I think it's loaded. If not, yes, please. I have another way of getting into it. So can you guys see the PA Share home screen? Yes. OK, so real quick, um, we'll go over the dashboard and then we'll go to the response screen. This is the external user dashboard. So any projects that you've submitted would be found here. The ones that are open, ones that are closed. Closed means that we've completed all our reviews and closed it out internally. My submissions, this is where if you began to data enter a project, and you hit finish later, uh, or you know, you would come in here and be able to locate it. Now you're going to need to know um, the token number or the project name. Both of those appear here. If we sent you back an email that something was insufficient, you can go to your dashboard. You don't necessarily have to use the link in the email. You can go to the dashboard and find it here and go to that project. You do need the comment from the email. Things that have been submitted but haven't been processed by the SHPO yet, like that project I just um, and data entered in the demo, could be found here under submitted. So they've been received, but they haven't been processed. And then if something's been processed, it would appear here. My request, um, this is if the SHPO asks for more information. It's going to be here, and you can click on go to take you over to that project. The one I think we want to look at is um, SHPO responses. So mm, go to this one. I don't actually know. This might be where Casey has to share a screen. That's fine. Yeah, you might. 
because I don't think any of these are completely finished through review that I have under test. So if you want to share a response, um, that would be good. He can show you the response screen and I'll, I'll maybe talk you through it. Does everybody um, see my my screen? Yep. All right. I did not I did not uh, attach a letter to this one. I'm sorry, but uh, well, I can show you where it will be. So this is the project I just entered a few moments ago. Um, in this case, we've asked for I've had them us both asked for more information. Uh, ship a response. If you have no effect, it'll show up here as no effect, no effect, and there likely won't be anything attached. Um, had we written a um, a letter, say there was an adverse effect or something a little bit more serious, um, it would attach. Oh, sorry, there is an ER uh, summary letter now. So um, this is our correspondent. Oh, oh look at yeah, that. This, this is brand new. This is brand new. OK. Has anybody used this response? Um, hmm. Yeah, this, this is, is just, yeah. this was only supposed to, wasn't supposed to be in test today. That's why we're kind of surprised. Has anybody seen these responses before? Okay. No. I, I, yeah, I, have not, I think we've only submitted two projects so far through the system. So. Okay. Well, there used to be a print summary button on the right hand side where Casey's pointing, but now all of your responses are going to be under SHPO attachments. Sorry, Casey. Yeah, it was, it was confusing because we had a SHPO response button that would, uh, if we just put in a simple no effect, no effect, that would populate the language in that uh, re, uh, print summary, and you could click on that and have a paper copy of, of that response. Um, whereas if we had something a little bit more complicated or we had real comments, we would put those in a letter and attach it. So it, it would get very confusing. So now it's all going to be under the SHPO attachments correspondence. Um, OK, so in this case. Our our SHPO response is here. Uh, we've both asked for more information. Um, comments. I just said see the request for more information. Uh, I actually put some in for Barbara, but those did not populate. Um, so then you go scroll down and you go to SHPO request more information. Uh, my description, um, my determination says that basically this is a high probability area and it needs to be uh, subject to a phase one survey. In Barbara's, I've asked for a full, full HRSF. Um, which which would, would say normally evaluation level documentation instead of HRSF. Yep. Um, so when I said earlier today that you should not enter archaeological resources at the initial uh, submission, this is the point in which you add archaeological resources. Um, you, you click on this and same for um, if Barbara asks for an evaluation, you click on it here, you go up to the top process button, click on that. And in my case, you'll open up the survey details page. Um, this is again, this is more for an archaeologist. So if you hire a consultant or a consultant that's hired to do the project, this is pretty much where they take over. They'll enter survey details and further down here, they can add resources. Uh, once you've added resources, you submit them and, and filled out the minimum survey uh, record. You submit the SHPO, we assign trinomials and kick it back to you so that you can finally add your report at the end. So it's kind of a two to three step process for archaeology. Barbara, do you want to add anything here? Well, I would say it's really important to remember that we have to request resource information. We have to request surveys. So if you have already done, um, and it's not an initial submission, and you've, already, you've documented a resource, and you want to send it to us, we're going to literally have to open up the gate for you to do the data entry. So you're going to have to reach out to your reviewer to let them know you, you've done um, a survey or you have a resource you want to data enter. At the time of initial submission, you can enter buildings yourself. But after that, we have to open up um, the fields for you to actually do the data entry. So I'm going to show you um, how to submit additional information if we don't ask for it, I think. And stop uh, sharing. Yeah, and I'll switch back over. So does anybody have any questions about the review response at this point? So 
if we needed um if it was a simple response say no historic properties affected or something along those lines if we needed to um, print that responses documentation to attach in our record system we can just go down scroll down to that bottom mm -hmm. that's that system generated letter and use that exactly and, and it used to be that our custom customized wrote you know written letters that were like for adverse effects or complicated projects were there and then the system generated response was ever under print summary but now you find it all in one place so you're either going to have a system generated response which is going to look a lot like our letters because it's going to be on letterhead um, but the reason i couldn't get into those response screens was because they've reformatted everything in test obviously um, so it's good casey had one and he just entered and um, so that is brand new. You guys are, you've seen the brand new um, response. So can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay. I wanted to real quickly show you how to search and um, let you know about a couple things in terms of the functionality of search. Okay, maybe it's not going to work at all for me. <laughs> okay. All right, yep, there was that response I was trying to get to. And this is the old print summary that I was referring to. So if you have projects before um, April 8th, because I think this will go over into production tomorrow, then you might see a print summary button or you, you might see it here, but you would just click on it and highlight it and click on view to download it and it'll give you the option to download or um, there. So that's our official response. But to go back here, um, I wanted to talk to you about a couple things. The first, first one is the search. Uh, there's a lot of search functionality in PA Share. Um, the search screen has criteria-based search over here on the left. It has the map-based search here, and then the results show up down here in the bottom. Now you can toggle and make all of these um, different sizes depending on you know what you feel like you need more room for the search um, there's quick search which is probably what we you know would use the most if you wanted to just look up a project number or a resource uh, name that's all here the basic stuff for projects um, it's important to remember that we've changed the format of the project number so you know it's a year the PR and then the sequential number if you have a former project um, that had an ER number, what you would do is you would Google it under legacy project number or search for it under legacy project number rather, and then it would um, show up. I wanted to show you um, a couple things about this. Like, let's say, um, let me just enter a project number up here. You can just hit enter, you don't really need to go. Um, so here's the project. It's the Rachel Carson Homestead Roof Replacement. Now, if I'm a contact on that project, I can go to the project and see um, a lot of information like the name, the description, what its old ER number was. I can see a history of the submissions. Um, I can, I know I'm looking, we're scrolling really fast, but I can see um, information that was provided under project documents as attachments. There's a lot I can see. And I think actually right now I'm logged in as an internal user, but what I want you to know about this search screen to go back out here is if I had data entered a project where I was not a contact. So I'm just gonna search on any project name. Um, I'm not a contact on that project. When I go down here to go to the project, oh, it's because I'm logged in as an internal user, but if I'm not a contact, it's not gonna allow you to access that project. It's just really important. Um, see if this is working yet. This is my external user screen. And for some reason it's defunct, it's not working. 
But just suffice it to, to say that if you are searching on a project and you find it, um, you're probably not going to be able to see any information, including um, the boundary of the project, unless you're a contact on it. Okay. The other thing, um, let's say that you have an existing project, like um, this project here, and you want to, let's get one that's more recent. You can sort these columns by just clicking on them. So here's a new one for the Newburgh Borough Building. You're going to add an ADA ramp. And I know that that I have, let's say I have an ER number for that project. I know, um, I think the ER number is probably how you're going to look for your old projects the most. So let me just show you what you're going to need if you want to submit supplemental information on an existing project that has an ER number. You're going to first need to go in and search on that legacy um, project number. Then you're going to have to get the ER, the new project number, the 20, the year PR and sequential number. You're going to need to write that down. So you need to know one, um, the number. And then two, if you can't get into that, like I click on go to and it's not letting me access it. I know I'm not a project contact, so you can email PA share at PA.gov or help desk, or you can email the reviewer and ask them to add you as a contact on the project. You have to be a contact on the project before you can submit additional information. So if you remember out here at this screen, we have the project supplement go down here or I can go to the wizards. There's two different ways to get there. You can use this bar over on the left or I can go down here and visit the project supplement. So I would enter my email address and then um, the project number. I just got a different number here, but I know I'm a contact on this one. Hit search. And it'll say search success if you're a pro project contact and it will allow you, let's say you want to send in updated plans. Okay. Add an attachment, upload that and send it over. I am live, so I'm not going to do that. Um, I'm not actually in test. So that's how you would send in a project supplement, but this would be information that um, we're not asking for but you know you're you're volunteering to us and it would not be again a resource or a survey so that that's if there is an existing project and if you're not a contact you're going to have to email us to get yourself added so i think that's everything so we wanted we'll just, to cover go ahead will the review um will that trigger someone to um to review it and potentially issue additional yeah. responses so we had a change in the scope of work that we wanted to provide to you that we would go through this system and then someone would provide right. concurrence or, or should some other comment right. um, if it required yeah. it. Okay. Yep. That would that's exactly how it would work. Um, um here it's working again. Yep. So uh, one question that we had um, as a team about um, this search functionality. Um, is there any way um, to have visibility on archaeology layers um, or if you're not section 106, I mean, if you're not SOI qualified for archaeology or if to have a team member be a proxy, or is it only those folks that are uh, SOI qualified for archaeology? Are you asking specifically about the site locations or um, the probability well, model? Um, I guess a little bit of both. I guess, okay. you know, if we're, if we're looking at a map to see if there are any known sites within our APE, um, right. You know, I, I guess I, I, I did realize that you can see you can do a search um, within a certain polygon and it will return some results, but then you can't see any information on it. So um, obviously it's a protected layer, understandably, but I'm just wondering as a team, is there any way for us to see that? Well, um, you can see the probability model now or you should be able to if you are a professional or business user that just went into test. So. If you try that and you can't see the probability model, let me know. 
um, but you should now be able to see that. The site locations though continue to be restricted um, to those who have archeological privileges. And there is some discussion of having like a planner access like we did before. So you would you know, search on a specific area to see what was previously identified there and you would get some information on the archeology span sites. Um, but that, that functionality doesn't exist yet in the system. So I don't know if you have more to add, Casey. No, just at this point in time, unless you're an, an archeologist that has uh, been granted archeological privileges, you're not allowed to see archeological sites. So you do have to meet the SOI standards. Gotcha, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll, let, um, I'll let someone know that, you know, folks are interested. I, you had planner access before at least. Um, as someone on our team did. I personally did not, okay. but a lot of our team has changed since um, the old system. So we do have several folks on here that just need to submit their request for access for archaeology because they they do have the degrees and field experience to qualify for it. So, um, but yeah, I mean, if that's a possibility, we would probably prefer someone to have planner access if it's if it becomes available. Sure. Well, and. And the more feedback we get, the more we can say we need to elevate that. There's um, a number of fixes or you know revisions to the system and sort of the priority is determined by demand. So if you see that it's something you really need, just let us know and um, I'll at least mention it to our uh, group that's working on the fixes. And in, and in the meantime, I would I would suggest that if you do have uh, staff that meets SOI interior, um, SOI standards uh, that they apply for archaeological privileges. Do thank you. Um, does anyone on the FEMA team have any additional questions? I know the only other um, person on this call besides Kelly that's um, used the system in practicality so far has been Courtney. Hey, Courtney, did you have any questions or experiences that you wanted to talk about? No. Um uh, I don't think I'm going to add anything new because I know Kelly's final questions that she asked about the previously identified resources and if we had to, you know, edit, you know, issues with editing the existing uh, entry versus adding a new entry. I had basically very similar issues with the project several weeks ago where, you know, a resource had been previously identified, uh, but I couldn't actually edit the existing entry. I had to create a brand new one. Um, I also at that time though got a bunch of you know error messages so I'm I'm positive it was a, a glitch in the system but um, with what Barbara said you know still send an email I'm definitely going to be doing that because I did take screenshots um, but again just seeing you know the uh, the how to that you know Barbara and Casey just did you know it seemed like maybe that issue is maybe been fixed, but I don't know. But I will still send an email for sure with the uh, weird errors I had several weeks ago, but thank you. Yeah, I, th I know that some of that has been fixed, but, but how recent were your issues with it? Probably within the past month. Let me double check. <laughs> OK, yeah, because I did we we keep tickets to track all of these issues. And I put a ticket in for that for PennDOT um, probably three weeks ago, and it seems to have been resolved. So I would just encourage you to try it again. If you have the same issues, please let us know. Because it sounds like it, it sounds very similar and it may have, may or may not have been resolved. Yeah, it was definitely within the past three, three, four weeks. So yeah, I will I'll send an email just, you know, be like, these were the errors I got in case, you know, the PennDOT team was getting okay. completely different errors, you know, definitely will help your data team. Thank you. Well, we really appreciate your time. And, and we appreciate yours. Thank you for showing, demonstrating this to us. I mean, I'm sure we will probably have more questions as we continue to use the system. But in my experience, the PA share email um, account has people seem to be on top of it and mm -hmm. we get very quick responses. So we appreciate that being available to us. And um, yeah, we're just excited to use the system. And we think that the search functionality is probably going to be even more user friendly than the than the old system was. So. Yeah. We hope so. Thank you. And I what I'm going to do is it takes a little while, but we'll get this uploaded to our YouTube channel and then share it with you. 
And so if anybody couldn't attend, they'll be able to go back. And um, I will follow up with your questions about the bibliography, Kelly. Great, thank you. Well, have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara and Casey. We appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye.